Have you ever been really curious how access to cannabis in Germany works? Well, in today's interview, we're going to be interviewing Lucas Roth to specifically discuss the distribution of cannabis products throughout the 16 federal states in Germany, focus on THC products, CBD products, and whether or not products should be irradiated. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, Lucas. It's great to have you on uh, today. Uh, you're going to be speaking about cannabis in Germany for us. But before we get into that, could you give us a bit of background on how you got into the cannabis industry? Yeah, sure. Jeff, thank you so much for the invitation to today. I'm really excited being here. Uh, my name is Lucas Wood. I am from Germany, grew up there. And uh, 2011, uh, 2012, when Colorado and Washington legalized, I uh, I, 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 it, it triggered my interest to work with cannabis. Uh, I was learning a job in a German uh, apprenticeship program back then and decided to go to Amsterdam for my, uh, for my university education thereafter. And during my studies in Amsterdam, I had the chance to study in San Diego, California for one semester, where I got to know a cannabis industry on the opposite end of what I knew from Amsterdam back then. Like Amsterdam, especially back then, was very rough and rather unprofessional compared to the standards I got to know in California. Uh, then I had an internship afterwards in Barcelona, where again I got to know a very, very different industry, much more professionalized um, and much further advanced than what I got to know in Amsterdam as a as a foreign student back then. Uh, and then I was very lucky to start to get a job with a seed producer from Spain, uh, with, which allowed me to travel the world, mainly in Europe and Northern, uh, Northern America, Canada and the US, but sometimes South Africa or Israel as well, and sell seeds to license producers, to other seed banks, to, to anyone who needed bigger amounts of seeds. And it helped me to develop a pretty strong network work internationally in, in cannabis industry. In 2018, I swapped that job, or 2019, I swapped that job and jumped to a German distributor of, of pharmaceutical cannabis. The German government had just launched a new legislation that allowed pharmacies to sell uh, cannabis to patients with a prescription. And there were new, even though there were thousands of pharmaceutical distributors already, there, there came up a few, by now it's around 100 that are specialized in, in cannabis. So I got to know the German pharmaceutical market for a couple of months before I personally, I, I don't live in Germany anymore. So I live in uh, Spain and Portugal and I really missed that place. So I, I was like, yeah, really want to go back there. Went back down so to Southern Europe and started my own seed bank with a friend of mine because I was still really passionate about, about seeds. But in Europe, the market is very much div divided and recreational, which is uh, often a grain market zone or you look for loopholes and on the other side the pharmaceutical market which is a very traditional conservative market so i felt like i want to work in both and i really want to work on the other market work with these american and canadian brands international companies that aim for the adult market at the same time i wanted to work in pharmaceuticals wanted to work with uh, with patients and improve their access to medical cannabis so I partnered up with an old friend of mine who had been CEO of a medical distributor in Germany prior to that. And we started CSC Live and with a mission to increase patients' access and improve the overall quality of, of flower and product in Germany. And by now we help international companies that approach entering the European market or the German market in particular with any any work from uh, feasibility studies, uh, market entrance studies, social media strategies, etc. Wherever we can provide value, where we can increase our knowledge, improve our network, and obviously earn some money, we are very interested working in. And luckily, lately, Germany moved a fair bit forward, and we feel like Europe is going is leading that road now. Excellent. Yeah, that's awesome. It's great experience, you know, from the northern, uh, from North America all the way through to Portugal, Spain, German main market for medical. So that's great. Uh, what I want to talk about, and we'll talk about the developments for the potential future adult use in Germany. But before we get to that, let's maybe discuss current. Uh, how does one in Germany get access to THC flower or THC products and also taking into mind maybe the aspects of, you know, compounding from pharmacies, the magistral formulations. Can you explain that a bit for the audience who doesn't know? Yeah, of course. 
In, on the patient level, it's uh, still not particularly easy getting a prescription for medical cannabis because doctors are advised to try out every other option available first. But there are doctors who have acknowledged the potential of cannabis by now and who prescribe it more easily and for without trying out uh, opioids and other uh, products prior to that. So patients, in, uh, patients access to product has already improved very much. On the production side, um, Germany became popular in, in Europe and internationally as one of the strongholds of GMP, good manufacturing practices, uh, and GMP EU got very popular from our Germany. We have pretty high standards over there for product that comes into pharmacies. Um, now, since the German government wanted to avoid a situation where we needed to go through clinical trials for every kind of flower for years and years prior to market introduction, we have uh, the pharmaceutical com compounding, which means we get products that come from a GACP or GMP setting um, that gets treated or processed in a GMP environment, then comes to the pharmacist in bulk bags or even in single units, and the pharmacist needs to conduct one further step. So they either pack it into smaller product units, or they test is it THC in high in THC or high in CBD, etc. And by that step, the product becomes a pharmaceutical compound product that is allowed to go into the market. And this in increases the pace of the of market, uh, market access of product rapidly. So suddenly people were able to get product in 2018 already. Otherwise, we would still be in the, farm, in the clinical trials and patients would still be waiting for their product. No, absolutely. And it's always been interesting to me coming from a pharmaceutical background because that imagistrol formulation or compounding at the final point of dispensing uh, has always been seen to me as an element of risk because there could be something that goes wrong in the final stages. Uh, but it's a clever way for B Farm, the regulator, and just the general uh, regulation in Germany to allow access where it's not requiring a marketing authorization for a product with clinical support. So I appreciate the innovation. And because of that, we've seen uh, the patient market in Germany flourish to over 100,000 patients. And luckily, also, most of, well, two thirds of those patients are getting rebates from medical. So that's fantastic. Uh, and now this brings me to the question on CBD, because I think South Africa is somewhat unique in the world, not completely, but we have readily access to over the counter CBD products in South Africa. Uh, there are some limits of 600 milligram on pack sizes and 20 milligrams on dose. How is it in terms of Germany, in terms of getting access to a CBD product? Is it almost treated like the THC product? Are they lumping them together, the cannabinoids, or is there a bit more freedom? It depends on the uh, in intended use of the product. Uh, yeah. So if you have CBD products that are made for medical patients who get a prescription by the doctor, you can buy a CBD flower or CBD products in the pharmacy the same way you buy a THC products. However, the biggest share or the much bigger share of the CBD market in Europe and in Germany contains of loopholes. So uh, in late 2020, in November, I, I believe, uh, the European Court of Justice declared that CBD is not a narcotic, which was a major improvement because up to that point, no one really knew does the European Union consider CBD to be a narcotic or not. Yeah. Now we knew, okay, it's not a narcotic, but what, what is it then? And the European Union says it's a novel food, so we, we need to check whether it's actually good for human consumption. And these, pr these processes are still ongoing. So there's, there are no CBD products released to market yet, as far as I know. And instead, producers and providers of CBD products have found uh, rather creative solutions how to bring their, market, their products on the market. So sometimes you will find uh, mouthwashes. Uh, the, the labeling says mouthwash, even though everyone knows it's a CBD oil and you should swallow it, but it says mouthwash because officially, according to the product, uh, registration, it's not intended for human consumption. Yeah. CBD flower gets sold as a souvenir in some places and other in Germany very often as a tea or something. And many people know, okay, I will not put that into my tea and then drink some CBD hemp tea, but they put it into their, their cigarettes or whatever to, to consume it. But we still, in, on the CBD level, we still often work in gray zones and Slowly but steadily, markets are shifting there. So, for example, in Spain, 
Uh, we have regulators going harshly against uh, against CBD providers at the moment. And in some parts of the Germany, it's the same story. We have CBD stores where you can officially buy oils, where you can officially buy flour that then get raided by, by the police because it's still not entirely clear how that product gets treated by German authorities or by European authorities. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, we've seen a lot change in Spain as well, and that'd probably be a separate discussion in terms of the private clubs and the crackdown from that perspective, considering how free it used to be uh, in terms of that. But we'll, we'll have that discussion still to be had. Um, what I would like to get into next is obviously the big news at the end of last year, well, not completely the end, but uh, October, November, was the move potentially by the new framework in Germany to potentially a responsible adult use market. Uh, probably realistically by maybe 2024 uh, in terms of implementation, but it is obviously a big move, uh, which uh, which creates a lot of interest in terms of you know a lot of what I've seen in South Africa is people want to target exports to to Germany specifically as the largest European base for medical patients, uh, going for the whole GMP process. However, that's still only going to be let's say 20 tons of flour that's being shifted into that jurisdiction. Uh, with the adult or responsible adult use market, that opens up substantially. And we've seen how substantial those markets are in the US in certain states in terms of the amount of revenue. I mean, over 20 billion in mostly adult use products or their medical disparities are a bit looser defined than we would call it in uh, European standards. But how do you see the development with Germany potentially moving to uh, responsible adult use? Uh, what are the, what are the steps that need to still happen maybe and what what are what are the just give us a bit of context for that uh, decision making well germany got a new government last fall uh, so in december i think the new government came into uh, came into office before we had 16 years of conservative government even though chancellor merkel back then was no particular conservative person but we with the conservative party there was no chance on legalizing cannabis all other parties had declared step by step, yeah, we are pro legalization. So when that new government came into place, we became more optimistic. To be honest, prior to November last year, a small fraction of my friends and other people in Germany, I knew said, yeah, it's any any close that that Germany will legalize because it, it seemed it seemed to be so far fetched. However, Germany, out of the 450 million European citizens of the European Union, Germany stands for 80 million people with some of the biggest buying power in Europe. It's at the heart of at the heart of the European continent, and therefore distribution. It's a center for distribution all over the continent, and everyone here, especially the professionals within the industry, expect okay, once Germany legalizes, Germany has traditionally been a country rather to work against other countries legalizing. Once Germany legalizes, many other countries will follow. And personally, I'm, I'm excited to see what will happen next because the last couple of weeks, uh, first of all, the, the drug commissioner is, uh, is a, is a sub office of the Ministry of Health in Germany, and the Ministry of Health obviously op is is rather occupied with, uh, occupied with COVID at the moment. Yeah. So it might take some time. And the first couple of weeks in office, the new government didn't really move forward on that topic. Yesterday, however, the new spokesperson for drug affairs, I, I guess it's the English term, uh, came into came into office. And he's a social democrat who's traditionally been an uh, advocate for legalization and decriminalization of other drugs, legalization of cannabis and decriminalization of other drugs in Germany. And therefore, I'm, I'm very optimistic that something will happen. And Germany is very aware that, or the German government is very aware that we need to develop some kind of revenue streams in the near future because we, the COVID and other things gave such high expenditures. And all numbers in Germany calculating potential revenues and potential savings on by legalization are extraordinary. So easily 45 billion euros could be either saved or made extra by cannabis taxes, etc. So within the last 12 weeks, a lot, a lot of German people spoke to us and contacted us with questions like, okay, what can we do now to prepare uh, an, authorization to sell cannabis in Germany, uh, what do we need to do to get a dispensary license, etc. No one knows yet, but the demand definitely is there. And it's fascinating to see how quickly this country is shifting from this 
conservative old fashioned state into okay, we are going to legalize and everyone wants to profit from it. No, awesome. Well, I mean, uh, I'm one for commercialization just because it provides access and it normalizes and reduces stigma. So for me, you know, seeing ridiculous things where people in certain parts of the world are still being hanged for cannabis, contrasted with, you know, Germany, which is conservative traditionally, uh, and definitely very specific around pharmaceutical standards. Like, it's good to see the willingness to open it up. Uh, and I mean, botanicals has always been a big aspect of German healthcare as well. So for me, I, I support it to, to see the developments. And I mean, there's Malta, there's Luxembourg, all of them also talking along those uh, adult use markets. We know Portugal, you know, took a very good stance on general all drugs in terms of how to manage that. Uh, so it's a very interesting development. And it's, it's great because I've had similar inquiries, you know, it's just a lot of interest in what's going to happen in Germany in the next 18 months. And how do we prepare for that entry into Germany? Because if it does pull through on timelines, uh, not that those are all fully defined, it, it will be quite a, it will definitely be a very big, interesting discussion for the cannabis community because it sets up that big hub outside of the US and Canada uh, for the next primary market, really. Um, so fantastic. So now I'm going to get into something a little more technical. Hey, oh, go ahead. May I put one, one thing in? Yeah. One thing that everyone is waiting for now in Germany is that the government acts in a quick fashion against the downsides of uh, of criminalization so i don't i don't need dispensaries to be launched or public uh, legalized in germany next week but the german german population has one major problem in regards to cannabis it's driving licenses and in some regard racism so if if people uh, of turkish background or something get stopped by the cops on the streets for cannabis and the german government would have a very easy job to just declare police, the executives should stop working against cannabis. And if they did that, within a week, we could eff effectively decriminalize cannabis. And I'm rather disappointed that that hasn't happened yet. That, in, in my eyes, that would be the major big next step if we just stop the criminalization of con consumers in Germany. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've decriminalized for private use in South Africa in 2018. And even as of today, it's a, it's a challenge. I mean, I saw just a news feed yesterday about traditional healers being dragged with their cannabis plants from their own abodes just by the police. And it's, it's been free over, over three years. So it's, it's literally going to come up to fourth year in this year. So it's going to be a process. But at least with Germany, I know that communication to the, the Justice Department will be far more streamlined. And the stigma yeah. would have been overwritten by just the, the amounts of medical patients already in the framework. So they're all kind of familiar. So now to the medical framework. Um, B Farm is the medical regulator for Germany. Um, they kind of sit at a top position in terms of uh, the regulation in the space. But there's the 16 different states within Germany that tend to be very much self-regulated. Um, Bavaria is definitely an interesting one that we will want to discuss. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about um, how the different states within Germany, as well as maybe that interplay between the states and Bavaria, how does that work in terms of medical cannabis coming into the country and its distribution within Germany? Yeah. Uh, so we, in Germany, we have uh, these different states, which are regions, and it's the Federal Republic of Germany consisting of these different states. Within the state, we have counties. And on a county level, you have the, um, the medical observatory, basically, that governs every pharmaceutical coming, every narcotic coming in. Uh, they monitor the pharmacies, etc. And a German distributor that aims to import flour or any kind of narcotic product, they need to go through their local county uh, government and, um, uh, and apply for an import of narcotics. Then this local authority, they check is the producer legitimate, uh, has everything been done according to standards, is the distributor that wants to import actually licensed to, dis uh, to import and distribute these products. And in the end, the, each, each state has their own regulations, out of which all except of Bavaria are pretty similar. Uh, Bavaria itself has, the, has, one, uh, the, the, has one speciality, um, that uh, they declared THC or cannabis. Honestly, I'm right, not perfectly sure about that detail right now to be an API, and therefore it's 
it's easier getting product into uh, the Bavaria market, but then once it's inside Bavaria, you don't get it out into the rest of the country. Mm. If you get your product into one of the other states, you get it all you get it distributed all over Germany. But within these states, it depends very much on the county that you are in. So for example, some friends of mine, uh, they were applying for distribution license and they applied in one certain city and it took them ages and ages and ages until they figured out, okay, in this particular, in this particular county, there was some corruption scandal like 10, 15 years ago. And the local authorities became very, very strict and close-minded. Okay, this is the regulation framework that we need to work with. We follow it very, very strictly, and we are super careful about every step. If they had applied for their license half an hour down south or west, anywhere else, it would have been a much easier game for them because this particular county that they applied for their license in is a difficult one. So in Germany, it's very important to know where you are going, to know people in the area you are going to, and to understand the local market. That's why it's so important for international players to work with German native speakers, yeah. because otherwise it's almost impossible to, to have a successful market ex entrance on the first approach, because there are so many specialities in every county and state that even professionals from within the industry get to know new things all the time. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, so that's that's a good point. And I agree with that. You have to have feet on the ground in the country you're looking to operate on. Uh, and Germany is unique as well, because I mean, we've talked about this with the pharmacies. I mean, there's a legal requirement that you can own one primary store and free distributors. So basically, yeah. maybe four stores. Uh, and yes, there is centralized warehousing and supply that goes to multiple of these individually owned businesses. But it is it does make it more difficult because in South Africa, we've got very much uh, two or three major pharmaceutical outlets. Um, so if you want to implement a product into, let's say, a thousand stores, you can do it. You can then strike agreements. It can go to all the different provinces in South Africa and it will get distributed on those shelves for a certain period. Uh, Germany, it requires that more effort, you know, being able to get someone who then speaks to all the different pharmacy owners because you can only own four at any given moment um, and obviously there's probably loop arounds and work arounds for family members but I do think that makes it more challenging so it's a good point you've brought up and I appreciate that and this brings me to another question I have which is when it comes to product entering Germany and now specifically more less so APIs or finished oils and products but flour um, I know there's a bit of an argument between certain uh, let's call it states and maybe municipalities or districts around the need for irradiation uh, and non-irradiation of the product. And for anyone at home, irradiation is basically applying uh, gamma irradiation to a product to get rid of the microbial levels on that flower that's being sold. Uh, how, how do you see that uh, dynamic of irradiation, non-irradiation? I mean, we could talk about patient susceptibility, where it's probably appropriate, and then we could probably con contrast that with general, you know, healthy individuals who get access to flower and have a robust immune system. Yeah, I think it depends very much on the particular patient and why of in what kind of a setting they, they need to consume their medicine. Uh, so if you are a chemotherapy patient and you are in one of these isolation tents and you are not allowed to get in contact with any kind of bacteria, okay, yeah, then you really need an irradiated product uh, because otherwise if, if someone touched that product and had some kind of a cold or something, it, this product is, is life-threatening to you. However, the, the, the number of people who actually need a radiated product is rather low compared to the overall number of, of patients in Germany with prescriptions. Um, there are many HDHD patients, for example, who are in their early mid-20s and who consume cannabis very successfully to treat HDHD. And for them, they don't need irradiated product. They, for them, it would probably be best in many cases to pro produce their own product at home because the cultivation aspect is, is part of that, would be part of the therapy. But the, the radiated product, yes, for, for chemotherapy patients, it makes sense. There are other patient groups where it makes sense to have a very highly standardized product. But for the overall majority of patients, I don't feel like it's necessary. And I feel like there should be more freedom for patients to choose from different products. There should be more education about what means radiation versus what doesn't it mean. But on the other hand, it's a, it's not a reason for, for big drama in my eyes, because there are many very uh, 
very passionate consumer who, who present radiation as if uh, your flower then will give you cancer or something, or it destroys all the terpenes. But then reading studies about this, uh, this these, these things, I can't see that it destroys all the, the terpenes. At least there are some studies that suggest, yes, some terpene percentage got destroyed. In some studies, it's pretty much the same. And in other studies, somehow terpene level got in, the terpene level got increased. So you have two sides. On the one hand, you have the traditional pharmaceutical market who says, oh, we can't, we can't give out a natural product such as flour because you never know how much THC or active pharmaceutical ingredient will be in this uh, product. We need to radiate it and standardize it as much as possible. And on the other hand, we have people who are very passionate about cannabis who say it's a natural product. We should consume it as pure and as natural as possible. And they are both very loud and passionate about their arguments. Personally, I feel like it depends very much on who gets the product, what do they need it for, and then let them choose what they want to take and let them choose what's the best medicine for them. And maybe even let them try out. And right now, if you want to try out different products, you need to go to a doctor and get a prescription for each. It would be so much better if patients got a prescription for one type of for medical cannabis high in THC, for example, and then they can go to a pharmacy and try out different products and see which product is best for my, is it the radiated one, the not radiated one, high in THC, low in THC, etc. Awesome. No, I agree with that point. You know, uh, at the end of the day, I do think obviously patient choice, personal choice, that all tend to dominate. We've seen the same thing with uh, the vaccine situation uh, around the world, you know, around personal choice. We won't get into that. Uh, it's a loaded gun, uh, but it is one where I agree. The patient should have a say in the choice of the product. And you will have those two camps where one is really about protecting the patient and one is about personal choice of products. And to that point, I mean, the thing that it's really, it's exciting to see that that's becoming more of a discussion and the botanical medicines are raising up in the world and becoming mainstream. And I think this sets the pathway forward in this understanding from traditional medicine that unregistered products have a space in medicine. It's never going to be perfect, but we're going to find a way that makes it work. And on the point of irradiation, it also does sit with the responsibility of the cultivator. Like a lot of the contamination that could be a concern are based on journalists and ministers walking through cultivation facilities without proper PPE. I mean, that I find ridiculous for medical patients is, you know, if you're going to be a medical supplier of flour, then you should be taking all your protective uh, measures in terms of personnel and facility design to ensure that that product has already very limited microbials. And it doesn't necessarily have to be irradiated if it's cultivated correctly, but it is a tough ask because I've seen it firsthand. So, no, absolutely awesome. I appreciate your time, Lucas. It's been a great interview. I've really enjoyed it. And I know everyone watching will as well. I look forward to having you back on to uh, discuss maybe genetics, getting to, you know, the differences around uh, seeds, tissue culture, cutting of clones, uh, and definitely speaking to you more about developments in Europe. I can only say thank you for your time and your awesome inputs. Thank you so much, Jeff. It was a real pleasure being here today and I'm very much looking forward to getting in another invitation soon. Okay, awesome. Excellent.